much. Uh, praise God. Uh, well, I, I just want to thank God for this uh, privilege of uh, studying His Word. Uh, I, I'm always grateful of having such uh, opportunity or privilege uh, of teaching God's Word. This is our second class. Last week we were trying to see how the prominent figures in the church history understood the Spirit and His works. Today I will I will show you the identity of the Spirit. I think it's our uh, second chapter of uh, the module. So the identity of the Spirit is uh, a grand and a major uh, topic of our course. So you have you have to be so serious over this uh, topic. In this chapter, we will cover both the personhood and divinehood of the Spirit. I will repeat it. In this chapter, we will cover both the personhood, just underline the word personhood, and the divinehood of the Spirit. And we will try to answer who the Spirit is. We will try to define and grasp and fathom the identity of the Spirit, who the Spirit is. Is he a person or a thing? As I, as, as I challenge you last class. What is the place of the Spirit in the divine economy? Is he divine? I mean, does he have the, the, the divine attributes as God the Father and God the Son? Or he is just the mere power of God? So we will clear our understanding of the Spirit. Is he co equal with God or inferior? I think it's a very challenging question. You have to tackle it. Does he have all the attributes of Godhead or not? So these are some of the questions which need um, a serious response. I mean, we have to answer all these questions. Otherwise, our understanding of the Spirit will be blurred. So let me let me uh, tell you the objective of this chapter. What? we are expecting to achieve at the end of this chapter, at the end of this lesson. I will just give you two basic objectives of uh, this particular chapter. The first one is, at the end of this lesson, you will be able to grasp that. First, spirit is not a mere power, like wind or fire or like electricity. He is not an animate being, rather he had a person. Is that, is that clear? So first, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, confirm and affirm the personhood of the Spirit. He's not a mere power like wind or fire. The second objective is, at the end of the lesson, you will be able to grasp that the Spirit is not a created being less than God. Rather, He is co-equal with God the Father and God the Son. He is member of the true God. He's God himself. That's the correct and sound doctrine of the spirit. The spirit is not a person. He's not only a person. Sorry. The spirit is not only a person. He is God. So this is the two uh, objectives which we strive to achieve at the end of this uh, chapter. So let me begin from the identity of the spirit. Who is Spirit of God. Just write this down. The identity of the Spirit. The Spirit of God has a personality. Just write it down. The Spirit of God has a personality. Or the Holy Ghost is a person. I think the word person is a very misleading word. Many people understood or misunderstood the, the person with body. Is that not? The word person is a very misleading word. And people misunderstood with, with, with the body. There is a clear distinction between person and the body. These two words are not interchangeable. Person doesn't mean body, body doesn't mean person. When I say the spirit has a person, it doesn't mean that he has a body. 
I mean, you have to, you have to, you have to have a clear understanding of these words. When I say body, when I say body, it means uh, the tangible and out, out, outer physical part of every human being is in animals. We have a body, the outer and the visible and the tangible part. This is the body. The spirit doesn't have a body in such a sense. I mean, he doesn't have a visible, tangible, the corporal fact. He doesn't have. So the spirit doesn't have a body. So when I say the spirit has a person, or the personality, it doesn't mean that he has a body. What does it mean, person? What, what do we mean by the word the person? Person is the innate nature of human beings. So the word person, it's very innate by its concept. And the person is the combination of the human being, the human mind, and the human emotion.
the spirit of God has also the night. Night is the knowledge part. The spirit of God has a knowledge, but his knowledge is totally and completely different from us. As a human being, yes, we have a knowledge, yes, of course, but our knowledge is very limited, very shallow. But the knowledge of the Spirit of God is very vast. He knows everything. There is nothing hidden from his sight. You can, you can read Romans chapter 8, verse 27. Romans chapter 8, verse 27. You can read 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 to verse 12. Especially 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul uh, uh, had a wonderful revelation about the Spirit. He, he says, the Spirit of God searches the deep things of God. You see, the Spirit of God knows everything which is, resides in the hearts of God. He knows everything, nothing hidden from His sight. He knows the deep things of God. He knows everything which God the Father knows. So the Spirit of God has nine. I mean, He knows. The, I mean, he, he, he got knowledge. Search. The Spirit of God has an emotion. Yes, of course. The Spirit of God has a mind. Yes, of course. The Spirit of God has also a will. We need a matter of deciding. Will is a matter of prohibiting. Will is a matter of letting. As the human beings, we have a will. In that fruit. We have a we have a will to do and not to do. We have a will to go and not to go. We have a will to marry or not to marry. So I mean we are not robots. In that note, we have we have a will. We get salvation because of our personal decision. So the spirit of God, when, when we say when we say the, the spirit of God are the will, we are meant that He get the decision. I mean he can decide. He can he can let and he can prohibit. You can have the, 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 uh, you can have a proof text from the book of Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, even chapter 15. Especially in the book of Acts chapter 15, in the church of Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Is that not? While they were worshipping and fasting, the Spirit of God called Saul and Barnabas for his mission work. He summoned them. What does it mean? The Spirit has a will. He chose Saul, he chose Barnabas for his ministry. So ministerial ordinations were, I mean, the, 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 church, the church leaders ordained Saul and Barnabas in, accord, in, in accordance with the will of the Holy Spirit. Do you get my point? So, when we say the Spirit of God had a personality or the Spirit of God in the person, we mean that he, he got an emotion, he had a mind, he had a will. balance so I will I will I will show you how the scripture uh, confirm it and affirm it the deity of the spirit I mean he is co-equal with God the father God the son he is not inferior or less than God he deserves worship we have to worship him as we worshiped God the father and God the son He, he requires our prayer. He requires our praise. 
Why? Because he is co-equal with God the Father. Please write it down. This is a statement. The Spirit of God is co-equal with God the Father and God the Son. So I'm going to show you how, this, how the scripture proved this concept. How do you know whether the Spirit of God is the divine or not? Here is my question. Here is my challenge. How can we prove it? How can we check it? How, how, how can we know that the Spirit of God is divine or not? If that is your question, I will, I will try to answer it. Just follow me. First, the divine name is ascribed to him. The divine name is ascribed to him. That means he gets a name which belongs to only to God. You get my point? Let me let me let me give you two divine names which were uh, addressed or ascribed to the Spirit of God. First, he named after the word God. The name God was given to the Holy Spirit. By the way, the word or the name God can be given for God the Father. The word God or the name God denotes God the Son. And the name God can be given also to the Spirit. So God, Father God, is God. Of course, Jesus, the Son, is God, and the Spirit is also God. There is only one God, but we have three persons in that one. So when you, when you read Acts chapter 5 verse 3, then we find the statements of Peter. Peter called Holy Spirit as God. You can, you can read it and check it by yourself. Read it to Acts chapter 5, verse 3 by Yusuf. Don't forget it. Second, the name or title Lord is given to the Holy Spirit. Lord. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8. The Lord is the Spirit. Where the Spirit of God is, there is a freedom and liberty. That's the statements of Apostle Paul. The Lord is the Spirit. So who is the Spirit? He is Lord. Who is the Spirit? He is God. So the names which, which are given for the Holy Spirit affirms and confirms His divinity. God and Lord affirms the divinity of the Holy Spirit. Second, how can we know that the Holy Spirit is divine or not? The first proof point is the names or titles given the Spirit. Second, the divine attributes ascribed to the Spirit attributes. The divine attributes ascribes to Him. The Spirit of God possessed all the divine attributes. Can it can First, let me let me define let me define the word attributes. If uh, if this word is strange for you, for you, please let me give you a brief definition. Attributes means in short nature. Attributes means essence. When when we say the spirit of God has all the attributes of God, we mean that He had the divine, the divine nature. He had the divine essence. So, can, but, but can you mention some of the divine attributes? The attributes or the nature that, that makes God distinct from the rest of his creation? What are the things that makes God divine? Can you mention some of the things which makes God divine? You know, It's a very simple and shallow uh, understanding. The, the attitude 
so God can be divided into two. The first one is communicable attributes. Communicable attributes. Communicable attributes are an attributes which were communicable to human beings. Some of the attributes or natures of God were communicated in creation, in that it. The other aspects of God's attributes is incommunicable. The first one is communicable. The second one is incommunicable. Incommunicable attributes are those attributes which God didn't impact to human beings. An attribute which belongs to God alone. So, what are these incommunicable attributes? The attributes which belongs to God Himself. At least, we have four to five attributes. The divine attributes. The first one is eternity. In Amharic, the Alamawinet, eternity. God is an eternal being. There is no beginning and end for his being. He exists, start, I mean, from eternity past until eternity future. As you know, there is no starting point for eternity. No starting point and no end. So there is no end, there is no beginning for God. Why? Because he is an eternal being. So when I say the Spirit of God has a divine nature, I mean that He is eternal, like God the Father. Do you get my point? So one of the one of the divine attributes, one of the incommunicable attributes of God is His eternity. We human beings have a starting point for our existence. Is that not? We are a created being. As a result, we have a starting point, initial point. But for God, but for the Spirit of God, there is no initial point, there is no starting point. Why? Because He is an eternal being. No beginning, no end. Alpha and Omega. Second, omniscient. The other divine attributes, the attributes which distinguish God from the rest of his creation is omniscient. What does it mean? The word omniscient means. Omniscient means uh, uh, God, God knows everything or there is nothing hidden from his sight. Omniscient means God knows everything and there is nothing hidden from his sight. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 to 11. The Spirit of God is omniscient. That means He knows everything which God knows. He searches the deep things of God. That's what omniscient meant. Third, omnipotent. Omnipotent. This is the third aspects of divine attributes. As a divine being, the Holy Spirit is an eternal being. As a divine being, the Holy Spirit is omniscient. As a divine being, the Holy Spirit is omnipotent. Omnipotent means potent enough. Almightiness. Omnipotent means capable of doing everything without outside aid or help. I mean the Spirit of God doesn't need anyone's help. He's independent. He can do everything by himself, by his own power. Why? Because he's omnipotent, he's almighty God. In Amaric El Shaddai, He can do everything. We human beings have we, we human beings are limited in power, in capacity. When it comes to the, the Spirit of God, He can do it. I mean, there is, there is nothing impossible for Him. That's not. Fourth, omnipresence. Omnipresence. We have the three omni words. We have the three omni words. 
omni potent, omniscient, and omni or omnipresence. Omnipresence means that the, the Spirit of God can, can present Himself in all places at one time. I mean, time and space doesn't have any effect on His, on his being. He can present at any time at the same time. He filled the world at the same time, at one time. This is how, how David, the Old Testament prominent, prominent figure, understood the Spirit. Where, where shall I go from, from your presence? Come and see what it is done. Do you, do you remember this, this, this verse? Where shall I go from your presence? You are there on the heaven. You are there on the hell in the heads. I mean, there is no, there is no place where, 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 I, where I shall hide myself. For all my presence means the Spirit of God presents Himself in all places. He is living everywhere at the same time. He is never limited by space and time. Praise God. So, so far we were trying to see the personality of the Spirit. As a personality or as a person, he had an emotion, he had the mind, and he had the will. As a divine being, he is an eternal, he is omniscient, he is omnipresent, and he is omnipotent. So we affirm his personality and we affirm it and confirm it, his deity. I think so far everything is clear. If there is anything unclear, you can ask. The instructor, you need instructor, your boss. All right, let, let me come to you. This is a chapter of your module. The third chapter of your, your module. The titles and emblems of the Holy Spirit. The titles and emblems. Emblems, emblems means symbol or metaphor. So in this chapter, we are going to see the different titles given to the Spirit and the symbols uh, which were uh, given to the Holy Spirit. I think it's a very important uh, subject of your course. So, what the objective of this chapter? The objective of this chapter. At the end of this chapter, you, you, you come to understand the following three, three points. First, you will see different images or symbols ascribed to Holy Spirit. Different symbols. Can, can, you, can you mention some of the symbols or metaphors given to the Holy Spirit? What comes into your mind? The metaphors or the symbols given to the Holy Spirit. So we, can, we will see the fire, the wind, the oil, the water, a lot of uh, the dove, a lot of symbols were given to him. Second, we will see the, the titles given for, given for the Spirit. The titles. The titles given for the Spirit. Third, we will see the nature and function of the Spirit. That's wonderful and crucial. The nature and function of the Spirit. What did the Spirit do in our life? What did the, the Spirit do in the life of Old Testament figures? What did the Spirit do in the life of Jesus and the early apostles and in, in the early church? I mean, the Spirit was active and is active even today. So we'll see the active uh, functions of the Spirit throughout the pages of the Scripture. Just I will give, just I will, I will give you the highlights. And he will test it and love it. Praise God. So let me let me begin from the titles or names given for the spirit. Actually, there are a, there are a lot of or a bunch of names in, in, the, in the pages of the scripture. And I will I will just mention some of them. Uh, and I will never give you an explanation. I mean the titles by themselves are very clear, so no more explanations, explanation is needed. First, 
The Spirit of God is called the Spirit of God. Second, Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Christ. I think all these names are clearly, clearly written in your module. Third, the Spirit of God is called as the eternal God. I mean the eternal Spirit. Eternal. The Lalamawi Memphis, Hebrew chapter 9, verse 14. Fourth, the Spirit of God is called as the Spirit of Truth. Yaunat Memphis. This is how Jesus uh, perceived oh, uh, the Holy Spirit. This is the words of Jesus. Yaunat Memphis, the Mat Agize, where the Unatul Yimarachua. Do you remember this, this, this statement? Thieves, the Spirit of God is the Spirit of Grace. Six, the Spirit of God is the Spirit of Life. He is the one who gives an eternal life. As you know, there are two kinds of life. Bios. The first one is Bios, the natural, the created life. <coughs> an earthly life. And the second one is Zoe. It's a God-like life, an eternal life. When I say the Spirit of God is the Spirit of life, it, I, I, I meant He is the giver of eternal life. Right now we, 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 we possess the bios or the natural life. But the Spirit of God gave us a life which is different from the natural life. He gave us Zoe, the God-like life the quality life, and eternal life. Praise God. So the Spirit of God is the Spirit of life. Seven. The Spirit of God is the Spirit of glory. You manifest. You know. Eight. The Spirit of God is called us the Spirit of wisdom and revelation. This is one of the role of the Spirit in, in relation to Believers, he he give us wisdom. He give us revelation. He give us wisdom in order to understand the things of God. You know, without the aid of the Spirit, no one, no one can know God. But the Spirit gives wisdom and revelation. Nine, the Spirit of God is called us the promise, the Spirit of promise. Yet as firm and first, you know. The spirit of promise. Ten. The spirit of God is the spirit of holiness. He is holy by himself. And he requires holiness from his people. He is our, he is our sanctifier. He purifies our soul. He sanctifies our soul. And he himself is also the Holy God. 11. The Spirit of God is called us the Spirit of Faith. I mean, He communicates, He imparts faith to the people of God. He is the source of faith, as He is the source of wisdom and revelation. 12. He is the Spirit of Adoption. He gave us the spirit to cry, Abba, Father. You see, He gave us such kind of a spirit. He sent to us the spirit of adoption, the spirit of sonship. After that, we can address God as the Father. Last but not least, the spirit of God is comforter. Or a paraclete, as my manifest, as I. The spirit of God is comforter. These are some of the titles. These are some of the names which were given to the Holy Spirit. Actually, we can mention many titles. Titles which are emanated from the Bible, but for the time being, it's enough. Let me come to the emblems or symbols 
of the spirit. I will show you some of the metaphors, some of the symbols which were given to the spirit of God. So these symbols will help us to uh, understand his nature, his function, and his attributes also. I will, I, I, will, I will just only give you five symbols. The first one is the Spirit of God. Uh, I mean, the, the, the symbol Dove was, was given to the Spirit. In the uh, Gospel of Matthew and in the Gospel of Luke, do you remember while Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River? After his baptism, the heaven opened and the Spirit of God was descended over him as or like the dove. For so there the Spirit of God was symbolized in such a way as a dove. So what is the metaphor of the dove? What, what is the rationale behind this metaphor? So the symbol dove denotes peace and Gentleness. I think it's a very familiar metaphor. Dove can, can be taken as a symbol of peace, as a symbol of gentleness, as a symbol of quietness, and even as a symbol of purity. So whenever we, we, we think about dove, all this uh, stuff can, comes into our mind. Gentleness, purity, peace, and quietness. Second, oil. Besides dove, the spirit of, uh, I mean, the metaphor oil was uh, given or used for the spirit, oil. Both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, oil denotes to the spirit of God. You know, in the Old Testament times, the prophets and the kings and uh, the priests were anointed with, uh, with ointment. And oil denotes light, healing, and power for ministry. Third, water. Water. Water taken as a metaphor. Can be taken as a metaphor for the Spirit of God. John chapter 7. It is used as a symbol of life and cleansing. Water taken as a symbol of life and cleansing. For so spirit is giver of life and he cleanses us from all dirt. You can, you can uh, check also Ephesians chapter 5 verse 23. 4. Seal. Mahita. Malatim. Ephesians chapter 1 and chapter 4. Ephesians. The epistle of Ephesians chapter 1 and chapter 4. And last 5. The wind. 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 You can, you can, you can see Acts chapter 2. At the day of Pentecost, while the apostles and their colleagues, while they were praying with one accord, the Spirit of God came into them as the whirlwind and dominated all of us. As the whirlwind. So, wind is a sign of power. So, these pipes are the emblems or symbols uh, given for the Spirit of God. So, today we were trying to see the Person, personality and deity of the spirit then we were uh, try to cover some of the names and titles given for the spirit and the symbols or the metaphors or the emblems used for the spirit of God I think things are very clear if you have anything unclear you are welcome God bless you